Austria, Canadian astronomy history. Um, uh, here we go. So in 1960, astronomers from the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory decided that Canada has to have a large telescope and they wanted it in Canada. And of course, Western Canada was felt to be the best place. Um, uh, so uh, various um, sites were um, investigated. Um, they wanted to have a 3.8 meter telescope, which is 157 inches. In September 1964, Prime Minister Leston Pearson's cabinet approved a Confederation telescope, you know, for Canada's upcoming centennial. Because Queen Elizabeth was visiting Canada in that year, they decided to commemorate the visit by calling it the Queen Elizabeth Second Telescope. A number of these places were um, investigated and it was felt that Mount Kobau at 1, 1,962 meters or about 6,500 feet above sea level was the best site of all. Um, Mount Kobau is near the town of Osoyoz, BC. It's very close to the Washington state border. It was chosen because of its superb seeing. Double stars were often resolved to their diffraction limit, and there was a, and there was a large number of clear skies. So grandiose plans were made for the top of Mount Kobau. Not only was there going to be the telescope, but there were going to be secondary telescopes, a number of other buildings, and even a visitor center, which uh, was becoming a, quite a big project. Astronomers from Eastern Canada weren't too happy that astronomy in Canada was going to move to um, Western Canada. And there was quite a bit of opposition to this. And also, um, the measurements that had been made of Mount Kobau were often made during the summer when it was very clear. But in winter, uh, weather was much poorer. One study sh showed that there were only 241 observable hours from mid-January to mid-June. In, in 1967, the Carnegie Southern Observatory approached um, the DAO astronomers with an offer saying that they wanted a partner to build a telescope in Chile and the Carnegie would pay half the price and the, it would cost much less to build a telescope in Chile than in Canada. So suddenly many astronomers from Canada decided Maybe Mount Kobau wasn't such a good idea after all. Eventually, Canada went into negotiations with France and, in, and the Mount Kobau site was canceled. Queen Elizabeth telescope was gone, it was scrapped. And instead, Canada got a partnership in the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. That's where our money went. And now all that remains is, you know, a beautiful mountain and there's an annual star party on Mount Kabau during new moon every August at the same time as Starfest. So here's a picture I pulled off the Mount Kabau website from their 2019 gathering. I'm not, I think this year there was no gathering because of the COVID epidemic. Well, we of course had to visit Mount Kabau and I took advantage of the great astronomy in this really dark part of British Columbia. Here at the bottom, you can see Noel's house, five acre property with vineyard. I would observe from the driveway here. We had some really great nights. We got there just during full moon. So I was waiting each day. The moon was rising just a little bit later and later. And finally I got half an hour of dark sky and then 45 minutes of dark sky, etc. cetera. Um, Noel's father, uh, Mike, uh, was with us there. Oh, here's a picture of Mount Kobau taken from um, just around the corner from Noel's house. So it's really about 10 kilometers away, although the road to the top is 18 kilometers. Um, on one of the really good days we had, um, the, um, my wife Liz and I and Liz's um, brother, Michael, uh, we went hiking on Mount Kobau. There had recently been forest fires, you could tell from the trees. And as you could tell from the fireweed that is beautifully growing on top. 
Um, but there's also a lot of pristine, nice forests and great mountain views from the top of Cobao. Look at that beautiful blue sky. You can imagine during new moon how great the observing would be from that altitude. <clears throat> and there's um, Noel's father um, at, the, at the one of the two peaks of Cabal with the marker and with the um, Cascade Mountains in the background. And here's my wife Liz looking down towards the South Okanagan Valley. And look at that great sky again. Now, there, the town of Osoyoos is right at the bottom. Um, right around here is the border with Washington State. This is near, this is the last five days of our visit. Notice the fires, the forest fire smoke in Washington. That plagued us in the last few days, but fortunately on this day when we were on Cabal, the fire, the smoke hadn't reached us yet. Noel lives, um, Noel, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you live right behind this hill, right behind there. So she's halfway between the town of Asoyes and the peak. Um, there's the 18 kilometer gravel road going up the mountain. Um, it, it's a nice road, but not paved. And I could certainly have apprehension driving that at night to the star party. You'd want to go during the daytime. And <clears throat> here's a view in the other direction at the Samil Kameen River Valley, which is it's very good wine country. Um, our last three days um, in Noel's house, we were plagued with terrible air pollution and forest fire smoke that moved in from Washington. We did have some great observing nights before this, but at the very end, this is an unfiltered picture of the sun. Um, here's a picture during the daytime, you could normally see mountains way in the background. This is all forest fire smoke from the terrible devastation that they were having in Washington and maybe even in Oregon. And there's another picture of uh, what the smoky skies were like. So um, now uh, <clears throat> uh, we can show some of Noel's um, slides. So uh, I'll let Noel uh, talk about this one. Um, well, hi everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I am very new to all of this, but uh, have been inspired by my uncle and my father's interest in the night sky. So I recently got a uh, new DSL DSLR camera and uh, a really beautiful lens and wanted to get out there and see what I could capture. And of course, as soon as I got out, the first thing that happened is they got sent over to Chris for analysis. Um, so the first three, we have four photos here. The first three are actually taken on September 21st. Um, so uh, Chris, you left on the 16th, I think? Uh, yes. Uh, September. So the 21st, that's how long it took for the smoke to actually clear out. Um, and you will notice in a couple of the photos that it was like the only clear sky and then some of the clouds started rolling back in. Um, so this one was taken at actually 8.25 p.m. from my backyard. So that nice picture you saw with all the smoke and the pool. I was right beside that pool um, facing east. Um, I have a Sigma lens, 17 to 50 millimeter. Um, my camera, I should let you know is just, it's an entry level DSLR uh, Nikon. It is a 3,525 megapixel. The lens I'm using is a Sigma 17 to 50 millimeter and it's a 2.8 aperture. So I have it like full stop. Um, the ISO is 12,000 on this and the uh, focal length is 34 millimeters. Um, you'll notice with some of these as well, they're a little bit noisy. None of these images have been stacked. So all of them are just like boosted up that ISO so I could take one shot and then try to reduce some of the noise in post-processing. Um, but of course, I'm not quite sure what's going on in this photo. I'm just the one taking them. <laughs> we could go through some of the features. Uh, Noelle got a really nice view of the North American Nebula right there. And she got the Pelican right here, the Pelican Nebula near Deneb. Um, when I was observing from our house for the first time, it, we were able to see the Pelican and North American Nebula with binoculars. I remember at a previous meeting, I was asked, can you see the North America with binoculars? Yes, you can. It's really bright from there. 
and look at the gamma signy with the nebulosity and the dark nebulosity in the gamma signy region. You can even see tiny traces of the veil nebula in this area right beside this satellite streak. And one thing I had, and here's the northern coal sack, which comes out really beautifully north of Deneb. One thing that I had never seen before that was on my observing list that I did see this time was this little beautiful round dark nebula that my wife Liz and I observed. It's um, B361. And there in the, in the Hudson Bay region, you can easily see B353. Uh, so there's a lot of really nice uh, features in this photo. Um, here, here you can see the Andromeda. Yeah, um, so Noel, maybe you could tell us about this one. I'm not sure if that's the rising moon on this one. No, so that's actually Mars. Oh, um, oh yeah. Yeah, so there you can see that there's like a cloud haze, which with all the light just completely made it look way larger, but really beautiful in the shot. Um, so that's Mars rising. Um, and then yeah, the Andromeda galaxy. And then you can see that was the clouds sort of coming in. Um, as we got rain and have had rain for the last four days now. Um, and then, yeah, so this was actually taken about 10 minutes after the first one. Uh, again, 2.8 aperture, 1200 ISO or 12,000 ISO. Um, and then this one is the 17 millimeters. So I'm as wide angle as I can be with this lens. Um, and that is a 20 second ex uh, shutter speed. So Noel sent me a whole bunch of pictures. I picked four of them. I picked this one because I really like the composition. I love the fact that you could see the clouds and the tree in this one. And we even got her satellite dish at the bottom there. Yeah. Um, so here you have another, there's so many satellites in the sky. Here's another, um, I guess Andromeda with a satellite going through it. And you can see the constellation Andromeda. There's part of the square of Pegasus Alpha Andromedae and the, that's how you find the galaxy by going these and then hopping, star hopping to Andromeda. So you want to tell us about this one, Noel? Yeah, so for this one, I went all the way um, to 50 millimeters. So pretty much as far as I can go with the lens zooming in. Um, again, it's a 20 second shutter speed. I was actually surprised that I, I was able to get any of this in just one shot. Like there is no stacking happening. Um, and then I used an ISO here of 6400, so lower than the last. And this was actually taken at 9 p.m., so not too, too late. Okay, and um, here's a f the final picture that um, I picked that Noel sent me. Um, it's uh, essentially it's Cygnus. Here you can see the coat hanger, Calendar 399. Now, one night Noel came out to see what I was observing. She came out with her dog, and I showed her, oh, you got to see. I want to see a coat hanger and there it is the upside down coat hanger and here you've got um, Delphinus and you've got Sagitta the arrow. I tried to find the dumbbell nebula in here it's just a little bit too small it's in this area and I, I couldn't quite see it but I tried as much as I could but you've got a lot of nice dark nebulosity here so uh, you want to tell us about this one Noel? Yeah, so this was one of the first ones I took, and this was on August 14th. Um, it was at midnight, uh, 17 millimeter and 20 second shutter speed. Um, the, yeah, this one, I, I saw a question just popped up. There's no tracking happening. I don't have a star tracker. This is like, I cannot emphasize like how, um, like, just how primitive this setup is. <laughs> um, the first three there, I find like I had a tripod that I was using, but this one was actually taken by aiming for what I wanted using dish cloths um, and then setting the uh, the shutter timer to 10 seconds. So it gave me enough time to hit that button and run. Um, so very, very basic. Um, and then you'll notice because of that, because I don't have the star tracker on one of the first ones as well, there is a little bit of star trailing, but um, I had left the shutter open for about six seconds too long on that, just based on the rule of 500. So I'm learning as I go, but, um, yeah, these were the first four and 
these were like without any other devices using dish towels and then later on a tripod like this is the very basic that you can go with an entry level dslr so th that's the uh, uh, end of uh, end of the slide but i'll just say very briefly that um, the sky there is so dark that we saw the soul and heart nebulae and cassiopeia with binoculars I was able to see M33, the triangulum galaxy naked eye from there with averted vision, and the California nebula in Perseus was very easy. So that's the end of our presentation. Thank you, everybody. Excellent, Thanks. everyone. Excellent. Thanks a lot, Chris. Thanks, Noel. Any questions for either? We're going to be talking a little bit at the end of the uh, uh, meeting tonight about an online uh, introduction to astrophotography course. Noel, so you're certainly uh, invited if you're if you're interested. Chris can let you know when we're when we're going to run that. Chris, if you could unshare your screen, that'd be great. Okay. I have a question, Chris. When you said you saw the dark nebulae, were you able to resolve them? using the 10 inch knob or what scope did you have to use? No, to I, I had a Teleview refractor um, 85 millimeter that I, I carry on uh, airplanes. So that, that's what, I, I didn't have a knob, I had a, just a refractor. But you know, the, um, with magnification, you could see a lot of these dark nebulae. Um, if I can ask a question of Noel, Noel, you're clear, clearly picking up some of your uncle's enthusiasm for the hobby. What's on your Christmas wish list for equipment and other things? Um, yeah, probably like a star tracker <laughs> would be a go-to. And then eventually I'd like to get some filters so that I can start picking up uh, some more interesting lighting coming from the sky. Um, so yeah, that's where eventually, <laughs> that's where I'll go. But Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Chris, so you're working on that? Hey, Randy. Yeah, Randy, I'm trying to... Oh, stop share. Sorry. There it is. Okay, got it. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. That was, uh, that was excellent. Really enjoyed that. Uh, it's all, always... I never observed from that part of the country, but I know uh, people like Jack Newton and Deborah Suravalo, Deborah and Peter Suravalo have observatories in that area. Uh, they do uh, an amazing work, but also from time to time you get views of uh, fires that are in the area too. So it's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's uh, interesting, really interesting area, but it, Noel, it's, it's, it's rather dry there. Is that, is that pretty well the, uh, the thing that's uh, attractive? Yeah, it's a desert. So it's pretty dry for sure. Um, just across the, uh, the valley over actually at Burrowing Owl State Winery. Uh, it's the least amount of rainfall recorded in Canada. Uh, we have tumbleweeds. We have all of it. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's probably why Jack Newton put an observatory there 30 years ago. Okay, um, one thing I should mention is that we record these uh, meetings, so if you don't want to appear in the recording, you should have your video off, although uh, I don't know how all of the speakers would end up unless, unless we sort of flow through them. But anyway, just wanted to, to let you know. Um, Okay, um, so I'm uh, going to give the next presentation, and uh, it's a bit of a story to this. Um, so back in the uh, during the early days of the shuttle program, um, I. Uh, took the opportunity to uh, go and see some of the, the early early launches. And uh, looking at some of the, uh, the earlier pictures that I took, um, I guess what, 15, 1,500 pictures of the first few missions. Um, I've uh, published them from time to time. And uh, there's a fellow in the US who's putting a book together on the first few missions and he approached me and uh, he wanted to um, consider some of my work for the book and uh, to uh, in, encourage me. Uh, he said he would uh, rescan all of my slides with a professional slide scanner, which actually is really cool. It 
actually cleans the slide as it as it scans. So uh, I had uh, over the past few uh, months, I've had uh, nearly 2,000 slides rescanned, and so I thought I'd share a few uh, with you uh, today. So uh, these are the missions that uh, launches that I've seen, and so I'm just going to talk about the first five. Uh, that I saw in the uh, the first few years of the uh, of the program. So many of you know that I've uh, been involved, interested in the space program ever since I was a, a little guy. Really, the Apollo programs that got me interested. So uh, my op when I had an opportunity to go down and see the second shuttle mission as a, a an accredited member of the press, uh, I jumped at the opportunity. And. Uh, this was the first picture I took when I got down there, and this is sitting in the grandstand at the press site looking towards uh, pad 39A where the shuttle was. And you can imagine uh, it was a real pinch me moment just sitting there and realizing uh, where I was and, and what I was going to see. Uh, during the uh, few days before a mission, there were uh, press uh, meetings uh, and uh, different people would talk about the mission and what happened on the first mission and whatever. A highlight was when uh, Deke Slayton, who was the uh, head of the astronaut corps at the time and who was uh, a Mercury astronaut and he flew on the Apollo Soyuz mission, uh, he gave a presentation on uh, on the status of the mission and, and the astronauts and uh, so that was that was pretty uh, pretty amazing. Uh, there were a lot of tours. NASA was very keen to show off uh, the uh, what they were doing and the uh, promise of the shuttle program because there hadn't been a mission since 1975, a manned mission. So they were, uh, apart from the first mission that was a few months beforehand, uh, they were very keen to show off. So this is the uh, mobile launch platform uh, from the Apollo days, actually, a, a, a mobile launch platform number one was used to launch Apollo 8 and Apollo 11. And then it was retrofitted uh, and they added what they called this milk stool, which was a way that they could take a Saturn V launch pad and launch the smaller Saturn 1B rockets. And there were three of them that took astronauts to the Skylab space station and one to the, uh, for the Apollo Soyuz mission. So uh, that was still there and it hadn't, uh, hadn't been disassembled to be used for the, uh, the shuttle program yet. Here's the runway that shuttles would ultimately land on. This was 1981. The first one landed there in 1984. So it was still a few years away. Uh, but you get an idea how big that, uh, that runway is. Uh, we were taken to the building where they were preparing payloads for the missions. The uh, European contribution to the shuttle program, which gave them the opportunity to uh, fly European astronauts, was the Space Lab. And this is Space Lab 1. Essentially, it sat in the payload bay and it was a laboratory uh, where astronauts could uh, do 24 hours a day uh, experiments. And this one flew on uh, the ninth shuttle mission. Uh, the defense was uh, very keen to be involved with the, the shuttle. Ultimately, they wanted to fly a lot of shuttle, uh, uh, a lot of payloads on the shuttle uh, and have dedicated uh, missions. In fact, the fourth mission was, uh, was a dedicated shuttle mission, uh, defense mission. But also, they were supporting the, uh, the launches in a way that if, uh, if there was a, a, an emergency where the shuttle had to ditch in the ocean, they were prepared to uh, uh, rescue uh, the astronauts. So they put on this display right in front of the uh, countdown clock where they had a shuttle prototype and they had helicopters come in and, and it was quite the, uh, quite the cool thing to see. Although uh, after the Challenger accident, when the report came out, it made it very clear that if a shuttle orbiter had ever ditched in an ocean, uh, there wouldn't have been much of anything to uh, to rescue. So this is STS-2, uh, the Columbia, and uh, this is the uh, two nights before the launch, and uh, the press was taken out to the launch pad, and they rolled back the rotating service structure to uh, expose the orbiter. This was a way that they could access the orbiter on the, uh, the pad and, and load payloads into the uh, payload bay and, and whatever. 
Uh, so this, the first two shuttles had white external tanks and they were painted white uh, for thermal reasons. And then they quickly realized that they didn't need to do that. They saved uh, a lot of paint, a lot of weight. Uh, so after STS-2, the tanks were painted orange, or just the, the natural color of the foam on the tank uh, is orange. So this is uh, Columbia, uh, two nights before the launch. Uh, and then the night before the launch, uh, we had a nice sunset opportunity and uh, lots of mosquitoes, unfortunately. Back at the uh, press site, uh, you can just barely see the Big Dipper, the bowl of the Big Dipper rising there. The Big Dipper isn't uh, circumpolar in Florida. And uh, the lights from the, uh, the shuttle light up everything all around. And you see people have already uh, staked out their, their claim for, uh, for tripods. Uh, the morning of the launch uh, was cloudy. And uh, this was my perspective here. I always put a little Canadian flag on my tripod. Uh, it didn't look like they were going to go, but uh, the countdown continued and it got down all the way to 31 seconds. And this is a point where the uh, launch control computers hand over to the uh, shuttle computers and something was not correct and uh, it stopped. And that's essentially as far as it got for my trip there. It didn't continue the last 31 seconds for, uh, for eight days uh, later. Uh, and I wasn't there for that. So I missed the first launch, but it was still a really exciting opportunity to get down and see everything close up. So a few months later, I went back down for the third mission. Uh, here are the two astronauts, Lousman and Fullerton. Um, they uh, arrive on T-38 jets, meet their family, wave to the press, say a few words. And uh, here you can see the, uh, the orbiter with uh, an orange external tank. Uh, nice weather so far, uh, very nice sunset that night. And uh, always great to stand, uh, just we're only about 300 meters or so away from the, uh, uh, as it sits there in uh, all lit up. Uh, so the morning of the launch, you, you've got to keep your eyes open. You never know who you're going to see, whether it's a congressman or senator or a movie star or a, a starship engineer. Uh, so that was, uh, that was kind of neat to see uh, fellow Canadian Jim Doohan down there. And this one actually got off uh, about an hour later than they expected. Uh, but this was the first, the second mission to carry the Canadian arm, but the first one really to use it uh, to pick up something and, and do something with it. And uh, this was my first opportunity to experience uh, the brightness of the flame. It's, it's so bright you can barely stand it and uh, the rumbling, which really shakes your insides because we're only five kilometers away from the launch site. A week later, uh, they, were plan they were planning to launch land in California, like the first two missions, uh, but they got uh, uh, rained out. So they went to their backup la landing site, which was in White Sands, at the White Sands Missile Base in New Mexico. Uh, really beautiful down there. Uh, the first day they plan to land, that's not a snowstorm, that's a sandstorm. And the gypsum sand was so abrasive, uh, it just, it was like a sandpaper had been rubbed on my face uh, all day. It was really, really painful. So they uh, had a 24 hour uh, abort and uh, uh, the next day was much, much nicer. And uh, this is actually the only landing I ever saw, but it was compared to a launch, uh, the landings are super quiet, except for the T-38 chase planes. And they come in very, very quickly. They're really falling, you know, they, they talk about a shuttle being as aerodynamic as flying a, a refrigerator. And that's a pretty well what it is. It comes in very, very quickly. And lands on the, uh, the white chips. Uh, it was a nice surprise to see that David Levy was uh, at the landing as well. He had just moved down to uh, Tucson uh, a couple of years earlier, he got out of the uh, terrible uh, Canadian weather in Montreal and had moved down to Arizona. Uh, so we got a chance to, to get caught up. Uh, the fifth mission uh, was uh, uh, November 82. This was actually the first operational flight where they were taking uh, payloads uh, from paying customers. Uh, 
a brilliant sunset because there'd been a rather uh, rather big volcano uh, in Mexico uh, for a few weeks. And so that really made the sunsets red in the autumn of 82. And uh, again, it nicely lit up for everyone. And you can get an idea of all the number of people <coughs> there for uh, the press. They had uh, buses and buses of people at that point <coughs> going out to the, the landing site. <clears throat> or the launch site. So here's the launch of uh, STS-5. Uh, this had, uh, instead of two people, this had four people on board. Uh, they were planning a spacewalk and uh, they were launching uh, two satellites. One of the satellites was from Telesat Canada. So as a paying customer, uh, you get a nice billboard by the countdown clock. Uh, there you get an idea of the number of people there at uh, 7.30 in the morning on uh, it was November 11th, 82. <clears throat> Then a few days later, the uh, crawler has to go out and retrieve the mobile launch platform for another mission. And uh, the recovery boats bring in the, uh, uh, the solid rocket boosters to be taken apart and uh, retrofitted and filled up with fuel again for another mission. STS-7 was a, a pretty big deal because of the first American woman to fly. Uh, in June 83, it was actually a pretty exciting month because not only was this mission flying, but uh, the Enterprise had been in uh, Europe to the Paris Air Show, and uh, they flew it back on a 747 through Ottawa, and then uh, over downtown Toronto. <clears throat> and so you can see the, uh, the shuttle flying by on the 747. Uh, again, great press tours. They took us to the uh, flame pit of uh, Pad 39B. Uh, this was being prepared for shuttle missions. It wouldn't be used until 1986. Actually, the Challenger uh, accident uh, was the first to launch from Pad B. But you get an idea of uh, the depth of the, uh, of the flame pit there underneath the shuttle, the launch pad. Uh, NASA had an extensive uh, art program where they uh, contracted in artists from around uh, at least the United States. I'm not sure if it was out beyond the United States. But they brought them in and had them document the, the shuttle program in various ways. And there's some artists just uh, working uh, close to the, the shuttle. They also took us into the uh, orbiter processing facility, which is uh, where Columbia was being worked on for its next mission, which would have been uh, the STS-9 with the space lab. And there you can actually see the leading wing of the orbiter and the, and the uh, reinforced carbon-carbon uh, uh, when part of the reinforced carbon-carbon uh, pieces are, are missing there, but that's the uh, essentially the uh, the material that was damaged in the uh, STS-107 accident and uh, allowed the, the heat from the reentry into the into the wing. But that's the uh, that's right beside a landing gear, so that's a landing gear door open there. Uh, so here's Challenger the night before uh, before the launch. Uh, not a great sunset, uh, but then the, it got a little nicer. The sky got a little uh, orangey, and uh, uh, everyone exciting for the, the day before. So it, the launch was at 7:30. So at 4:30 in the morning, the astronauts left their crew quarters, and uh, there you can see the the five astronauts. First time, first mission with five astronauts. Uh, Sally Ride there. And uh, John Young actually behind the moonwalker, who was uh, involved in management at the time for the astronaut uh, corps. Uh, back at the launch site, a beautiful uh, dawn as, uh, as dawn was breaking and uh, everyone setting up for the launch, which was just after sunrise. And there's the launch of the seventh mission. Uh, the last mission I'm going to talk about tonight is the uh, STS-8. Uh, it had two firsts. It was the first launch of an African American, uh, Guy Bluford. Um, also, it was the first night launch. And uh, the little logo up here was something the crew put together. Uh, here are the four rookies looking out the window with their eyes wide open. And here's the steely eyed missile man, Dick Truly, the commander who uh, had, had flown before. So they, they knew what they were, were in for. Now, I'd seen on previous missions that the uh, accredited press could take uh, remote cameras out to the, uh, uh, the perimeter of the launch pad and set them up the day before 
and uh, these launch and take pictures of the launch. Uh, the trick is these things have to be self-contained. Uh, they have to be weatherproof, and that was the major thing about weather in Florida. Um, but also, they had to be set up such that they would automatically take photographs when the launch would take place. Some of them were triggered by light. Some of them were triggered by vibration. Uh, but the, the best way to do it was to trigger it by sound. So I talked to my brother, who was a, an electrical tech, technical guy. And uh, he and I put together a, uh, a box which uh, would uh, start taking pictures when it got noisy. And so we had no idea what the environment would be. So I built, I bought this steel box, uh, thinking that, you know, you need something steel. And you need to have it covered with glass in front of the opening and, and whatever. And it's really the launch isn't the thing that affects your equipment. It's really the weather. It's just Florida weather can just, just be a brutal. Uh, but the setup was such that uh, uh, we had a microphone, which is this wire. But also we put an alarm clock because if you set it up 24 hours beforehand and a thunderstorm comes through, uh, the sound from the thunderstorm could trigger your system. And we just had a little relay here, which uh, <coughs> uh, pulled a little bar and uh, set a little cable release going and you'd suddenly take pictures. So for anyone who's interested in what you shoot at a, a shuttle launch, it's 250th of a second at F5.6. Actually, I learned that 500th of a second is better, but you don't want to meter it because the meter gets all confused from the, uh, the brightness. Uh, but the uh, the alarm worked well because that evening before the launch, there was the most amazing thunder and lightning storm I've ever seen. And in fact, most of the uh, people who set up their remotes that night, uh, the lightning triggered their pictures and they didn't get anything. Uh, but we were lucky. This was our first attempt and this is the, uh, the night launch of uh, STSA. So I just wanted to share a few with you because uh, now they, they were nicely scanned and all the dust was off them. So uh, um, that's my presentation. Thank you. Any questions? I got one. Yeah. The, the very first picture you had at the beginning of your uh, presentation on the cover. That wasn't your picture though, was it? Uh, no. No, the, that, uh, they had... Uh, You'd have to be really close to the launch for that. Yeah, or it's a picture or something. They had, to, they had several cameras and as, as the shuttle, that's a later picture. Okay. Uh, but yeah, as, the, as the, the program moved on, uh, they tried different things and um, yeah, that camera not long after that picture is taken uh, would have, uh, whatever lens it had would have been pretty well wrecked. That would have been in a, in a really steel box with probably a plate glass an inch or two thick uh, to survive the uh, exhaust from the, uh, the solids. <coughs> yeah, very cool. I'd like to have taken that picture. <laughs> but just not standing there. <laughs> any, any other questions? Okay, let's take a short break and uh, we'll come back and uh, we have a few presentations left. Fred Benedict is up next. Oh no, I'm sorry, Krishna, sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, let's, Krishna, you're up. Share your screen. And yes, Swap and I have seen the Challenger on uh, Netflix, and it's uh, really well done. I, if you have Netflix, check out the, uh, the Challenger four-part uh, uh, program. It's, uh, it's quite, quite good, quite well done. All right, Krishna, it's all yours. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, this is Krishna. Um, I've been here for about a, uh, two years now, and um, ever since the pandemic started, it has been really hectic. For I know for everybody and uh, also for myself, but astronomy as a hobby has been really helpful, um, not only to keep me busy but also to 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 get to be to feel closer to the skies and to be closer to the nature. It is also the one of the only hobbies that I've seen that um, that helps us that helps me to maintain my mental physical um, uh, health together. 
simultaneously. And there are very few hobbies like that. So um, this was one of them. When the, 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 my, my favorite place to go to, to do stargazing is the folks of, uh, folks of the Credit Park. Unfortunately, it got closed. And uh, before that happened, I was able to take a quick uh, time lapse video to, to kind of show you how, um, how amazing the skies are over there. Um, this was about, uh, uh, this is a one hour video, uh, one minute video, but taken over the entire time until I think 2 a.m. Um, I'll quickly forward this over, but, uh, and soon after I took this, took this uh, um, time lapse, the, the park was inundated with a lot of visitors and the very next day it got shut down. Um, ever since then, I've been trying to find a good place to, to do uh, observing of the southerly sky, southerly hemisphere, and haven't seen one yet. The Binbrook Observatory was recommended by some of the um, some of the members in the group, and that has been amazing. I went there once, but uh, but the Binbrook Observatory is only limited for H, uh, the Hamilton Astronomical Association, and so I joined them. And the moment I joined them, the very next day, even they shut down. So I was stuck with only one place that was the Glen Major Forest. And uh, that was either the Glen Major Forest or the Long Sioux. And I started going there. So all my, most of my pictures that we'll see from here on are from Glen Major Forest. But this also, this also gave me a good opportunity to not take pictures. The picture taking pictures is something that many people do. You don't really need a telescope for that um, as many of you have shown. But uh, what interested me was you, using my equipment, can I retrace the steps that the, that the stalwarts did back in the day from uh, you know, 1700? So I started with Messier. Charles Messier collected about 100 and noted about 110 objects. And um, so far if from June till date, I've seen 57 of them. And uh, on lucky nights, I was even able to see some of the NGCs. Looking at NGCs was really surprising because I never expected my telescope was good enough for that. Um, but, uh, but, I, but with practice and uh, I think I got a little bit more experience with them and I was able to find them as well. And uh, not only the deep sky objects, but also we could do some of this observing from home. So this was a picture of uh, uh, using my telephoto lens on a tripod and the DSLR camera. And the, I heard about the lunar X and V. On this image, you'll see two uh, marked spots. One is, one looks like a V and the other has an X. They look as if an alien marked them on the moon. But these are, due to, these are, uh, <clears throat> these are um, optical illusions due to, due to the shadows and the reflections happening on the crater surfaces, craters on the surface of the moon. And this was interesting to take from home. And from here on, I'll take, I'll, I'll show you some of my pictures that I took. And whenever I take images, I never take more than 20 minutes. And these are the initial images that I took, which were, which, for which the exposure time was less than 10 minutes. And um, this was the last image and last observation this season till they, from, from the folks of the crit. And the, the time I did the, the pan stars, I observed pan stars, it was with Chris. And uh, we were, we parked, the park was still closed, but we parked around uh, uh, at the, on the side of a road for about a couple of hours. And we did some, re, we had some really good observing session that night. This is what was a lucky imaging. And the reason why I stuck to imaging when after I do visual observation is because of that. When I took this image of M52, um, a small purplish thing just started popping up on the side of the car, on the corner of the image. And when I looked back and checked the check the star sheets, uh, the maps, I found that it was the bubble nebula. So the next time I went, I took a specific image of that and merged them together. And I, th I thought uh, it came out really well. You can also see the, the wolf red star and the and the complete almost the complete rain um, that is that is blowing due to the due to the stellar wind um, by by the star over there 
this um, uh, uh, observing M33 has been a big challenge for me. I tried it last year, but I couldn't find it. This year from Glen Major Forest, I was able to see it as a blurry patch because it does not have a distinct central region, which we find in most of the spiral uh, galaxies. Um, here, the, uh, the assumption is that there is no supermassive black hole um, in the middle as we have on uh, for Andromeda and in Milky Way galaxy. This was another amazing uh, galaxy that I saw, the Pinwheel galaxy. I was able to find it on uh, in, uh, in a, transparency, a transparency five and also seeing five. There was no moon, uh, it was a new moon and uh, the skies were really clear. The object was almost at the zenith. Um, this is a uh, this is a cheating. This should not be here, but I will I will still put it because the Bodhi galaxies um, were really difficult for me to image. These uh, these images are are a stack of about an hour, or taken about ten minutes every, on every chance I get. The black hole galaxy. As you see, there was no. I haven't put any um, any galaxies from the Virgo supercluster because. The southern hemisphere, observing the southern hemisphere has been a big challenge from, from Toronto. Um, even the Glen Major, uh, Glen Major Forest and the uh, Long Sioux that were open uh, were blocked in the southern hemisphere by the, by the uh, city glow of Toronto. Um, this was a, this was a, this is an NGC example that I was able to see with the telescope. Um, one of the first ones, in fact. Um, without using any filters. The one thing I observed was that the, since I was using a DSLR and the object is rich in hydrogen alpha, the DSLR cameras have a low sensitivity for hydrogen alpha. So I wasn't able to capture color in them. However, when I looked at the image in grayscale, um, I, saw the, I saw the distinct features very clearly. This is my last image till date in the, the Andromeda galaxy taken using, not using a telescope, but rather a telephoto lens, the, 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 the lens I showed you in the previous image before. Now, the, the deep skies don't necessarily have to be the la only, only inspiration for us to take images and to, uh, to, to have some fun. This was an image of the Mimoko skyline from, from my balcony. This was a this was a, this was an interesting experiment I tried. the the new Google um, the new Google phones, the Pixel phones, have a special mode in them called astrophotography mode. So I tried that astrophotography mode for for um, for the sky, and lo and behold, it was a format exposure, no trip, but on, on just sitting stably on a on a on a platform, and I could see the double cluster in Cassiopeia. The, um, the, the Andromeda galaxy, the, um, um, the, I think this is the C13, there's, a, there's an open cluster near there, um, and that was Mars. So the, we do not necessarily need, in the current day and age, we do not necessarily need a huge telescope or a DSLR or a big lens when small smartphone cameras have become, have become really smart and they're living up to their word and terminology as well. Uh, to provide amazing views of the of the night sky. Um, going forward, after completing my messy, I do want to instead of taking astrophotography images, I want to start measuring the light intensities, and 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 do some of this astronomy work that um, that the that our forefathers did back in the day to see how far is the star, how far are the how does the intensity of a star change over a period of time? Does it change because of a, an optical binary? Is it because of other phenomena that are happening? So uh, I think we can do some of these scientific experiments just sitting at home. And thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Um. Uh, hi, Krishna. Uh, this is Ali. Hi, everybody. I recently joined uh, to ask Mississauga uh, since June. Uh, I had a question. Uh, did you have uh, for like uh, um, M33 or M101, 
did you have a, a, a guider or yes guider cam okay i just want to yes i use the i use the hq5 mount mm -hmm. um but uh, but when i you i don't use auto guider the um, i do align it for i do do the polar aligning manually by looking at the uh, approximate location of the pole star polaris in the in, in the ring of the polar scope and um, align it manually and then go for the maximum exposure that I can take. Um, with my experiment so far, I've been able to take consistent exposures of 90 seconds, but to get better exposures of up to two, I was able to take two minute exposures only once or twice in the last two years mm -hmm. um, because I don't use auto guiding. Okay, and oh, what's the telescope? It's an eight inch F5 Newtonian reflector. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Wow, those were uh, those were fantastic, Krishna. Thank you very much for sharing. Oh, versus Cat is just about ready to attack. Okay, let's uh, let's just take a, a quick uh, five minute break, uh, stretch your legs, and then we will uh, reconvene with uh, Fred Benedict. And uh, I have a few thoughts uh, at the end of uh, at the meeting, so uh, it should be uh, should be done by about nine thirty. But uh, let's take a five minute break. Krishna, do you hear me? It's an impressive presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I just watched the um, constellations from my home. I live right, uh, like, close to downtown Toronto. Okay. But um, I see, I stay up late sometimes, and I see uh, Orion from mm -hmm. my kitchen window. Nice. Yeah. So I haven't done There are some anything. filters that you can use to, to take some good pictures of uh, yeah. from the balcony as well. Yeah, but I don't have telescope, right? I just use my smartphone. Correct. Yeah. Uh, sometimes I do get, I do uh, 
the, you're right. The smartphone is very smart. I do uh, capture some, like sometimes Orion, I've captured it on it. Yes. But uh, it's grainy, but it's still, I can see it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, hi, Krishna. Um, I have another question. Um, sure, thanks for the pictures. I really uh, liked it. Like them. Uh, how busy is the Glen Major Forest? Uh, or on, yeah, usually, it is not so busy, but on Perseids, uh, at the time of the Perseids meteor shower, it got so cramped up. Um, I had to. There was. There was. I, I could barely see um, some of the stars directly. It was that bad. People were not um, cooperating at all. So, um, but still, yeah, <laughs> this is what it is. Where but is this place? Usually, it is not the 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 um, the folks of the credit. However, that's the best spot I have seen so far. It does block some of the east side view, but uh, but for southern, western, and uh, the northern hemispheres, they are so clearly uh, visible from there. Mm. Is this in Mississauga? Uh, near Caledon. Near where? Caledon. Oh, Caledon. Okay, okay. Because I'm a downtown person, so I don't have easy access. Right. For you, the Glen Major Forest would be closer. Okay. Where is that one? Near Uxbridge. Ashbridge? Yes. Ashbridge is Bay? It is a little bit north of Toronto. Oh, okay, okay. For half an hour drive. Have no drive. Mm. Okay. It's Uxbridge. Starts with a U, U-X. Oh, yes. okay. Okay, Uxbridge. Yeah, I know Uxbridge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I guess we see Mars now in the Jupiter and Saturn. They're very prominent in the night sky now. Right. Yeah. Once the smoke settles, then I think the, the skies would be pleasure to watch. When what settles the smog? The smoke, yes. Oh, smoke okay. due to the forest fires on the west coast. Oh, okay, I see. I see what you're saying. Yeah. I actually had a, an evening here that when I looked out to check the sunset, um, I could actually stare right at the sun. So there must have been that much smoke in the oh atmosphere. Oh my God. Uh -huh. It was just a beautiful round red ball and I could yeah. actually look at it. So. Uh, yeah, the, you saw Chris's picture. That was astounding. 15th and 16th of September. It's a very cloudy, like red sunsets. Well, at least it wasn't like that all the time. It was only like that for the last three days for us. Mm. Yeah, around your new moon, right? Okay, are we ready to start? Yes. Mr. Benedict, you are on, sir. I've All right, thank you very much. For a long time, so Let good. me share my screen, if I figure out how to do that. Oh, share, here we go. And go. hit this magic button. And you should have a full screen here. All right. Good. So I, I blame my little calamity that started this talk all on Comet Neowise. Um, I went to the local park, of course, with my nice big astro binoculars, put them on my parallel grand mount, showed it, the comet to a few people. And then when I took the, the binoculars off the mount, I dropped them and they did oh. not bounce very well. Oh no. They did not pass the military drop test. <laughs> so being me, I decided to research what's all required in order to collimate your binoculars because I was having a double image because it hadn't really done it before. I never had to really look into it. So I had to research, do a little bit of research. I'll just cover a little bit about some basic binocular types and talk a little bit about the difference between collimation and conditional alignment. A lot of people do conditional alignment and call it collimation and it's not the same thing. And hopefully you'll see the difference. Then I'll talk about how do you actually check to see if your binoculars are collimated. And I'll go through a few different methods because people have different, different ways of doing it. 
and I'll talk a little bit what you have to do in order to adjust your binoculars in order to get them into collimation. And then I've got a few next steps because I'm really not done. I'm sort of in the middle of it. So here's for the resources. I mean, there's a lot of information on cloudy nights on, on binocular form and probably about 80, 85% of it is really good information. I, uh, I had this, this uh, pamphlet for a long time dated from the mid 1940s and actually shows you how to collimate binoculars. And at the time I really didn't understand it, but I do understand it now. And it's a good piece of information. Then there's a lot of information from this uh, Orwell Astronomical Society up in England. And they basically talk about collimation and how you check it and they use the sun as sort of a collimating light source. And they got all their information from this gentleman in Spain, Rafael Camon uh, Cobos. And, and he has some really good innovative way of doing things. And actually I copied him on one of his little jigs, which you'll see. The only problem is he has a website, but his website went dark. So I'm, I'm missing a little bit of information from him, but uh, uh, I hope he comes back. And uh, I got this book here, Basic Optics and Optical Instruments. This is from the US Navy, uh, their training manual on how you repair their optical equipment. So if you wanna know how to repair uh, periscopes and gun sights and binoculars, it's a very good resource. Um, along with this gentleman, William J. Cook, who actually is a retired Navy optician, uh, optical, uh, uh, they call him an optical, opticals man. And he actually was instrumental in the writing of this book. And he has a lot of uh, good tips and he also officially coined the term conditional alignment, which is something that uh, the optical people never used before he got around to it. So here, here's the basic but fundamental binocular types. And it's really, there's fundamentally only two types. And they're relatively simple devices. So you've got one that's got sort of the poro prism design, and then you went with the roof prism design. And it seems to be that the newer ones seem to have the roof prism designs because they're the ones they fill with nitrogen. But all there is is an objective lens, a prism block and an eyepiece. And the idea is all of these have to have an optical alignment. And it's nothing more complicated than that, but you gotta know what you're doing. So here's the particular binoculars that I had that I dropped. I got them really cheap about 15, 20 years ago. I only paid $75 for them and I could have bought another pair. You can still buy these, but they're about $150, $160. But I said, I wouldn't have a lot of fun if I just bought a new pair. So I figured I'd decide, what can I do with the old pair? And one obvious fault that I found was that there's a, a spring that holds a prism in place and that kind of slipped out of, out of place. So I put that in and then I was hoping that it would fix my problem, but of course it didn't. So here's, here's what you have for a typical alignment problem, which gives you double images. You've got your two barrels of your binoculars, and of course, they're not pointing in the same direction. And that's what gives you the, uh, the double image. So here's my dilemma. So where exactly is my problem? Is it with the objective lens? Is it with the prism? Is it with the eyepiece? On which side is it? Is it the left side, the right side, or maybe both sides? And I had no other mechanical issues. So uh, now what I wanted to do after doing all this extensive reading and research, I wanted an objective rather than a subjective alignment method. And you'll see what, what I mean by that a little bit later, but I wanted something that's quantifiable and a repeatable process because uh, there's a lot of uh, ways that people do very subjective alignments and I'm not sure if they can get the same result twice. Anyway, so I had to find out what was the best method for me. So here's the goal. 
the fundamental goal, if you want proper three axis binocular collimation is your two barrels are concentric with the hinge, with the binocular hinge. And when you achieve that, you get, of course, a, your, your correct image, it's not double. But as you open and close the binocular hinge, your picture is still collimated. You, you still have a, a correct image. So it works for, uh, so basically everyone could use your binocular. What some people do is they do a conditional alignment whereby they only get the two binocular barrels aligned so that you have a single image. And they call that collimation and it's not. It's a conditional alignment because now what you've done is you've made your binocular good for only one person yourself. And it only works for one, what we call interpupil distance. I should have explained that before. So this is not collimation. This is just a conditional alignment. So just to bring you up to speed, the, uh, the human uh, visual system with the eye brain, you can take a certain amount of misalignment and still merge some images between some uh, binocular barrels. But, and your misalignment tolerance is greater in the horizontal direction than in the vertical direction. So basically your eyes can go cross-eyed and you could uh, basically still see something, but not vertically. And excessive misalignments can basically cause you a lot of eye strain and headaches. Plus also, if you have a lot of difficulty focusing your binoculars, chances are they're also misaligned. So here's from the British folks. Here's a way that they, they do a quick check on, their, uh, on the binoculars to see if they're aligned and they use the sun because that's a collimated source where it's, it's far away. So it's got parallel light rays coming to you. So you can be as simple as do a projection onto a seat in, in, your, in your garden. But of course, as the sun moves, that gets a little bit awkward. Uh, you can mount your binoculars on, a, on an equatorial mount and track the sun and project onto a screen. And you'll see a little bit later what you're looking for. And if you wanted to, and you have a reference here, and if you go on to get a little bit more sophisticated, you can have your horizontal reference, but you also put some pins where your eyepieces are. And you'll see that becomes very important in this slide. So for properly aligned binoculars, what you're trying to do is have your, the light cone is concentric about your eyepiece, because your eyepiece is here, Here's your light cone, and and this is where the pin is for your uh, for the for the eyepiece. So you want to bisect that, and it's the same on the other side. Now he calls this reasonably aligned, but you can see that this side is not aligned as well as that side. But it may be good enough, and I'll explain that in, in a second. So here's some of the kind of errors you can have with binoculars. You can either have your light cone projections too far apart, you can have them too close together, and you can have misalignments vertically. And the vertical misalignment is the worst one because um, your eyes can't have a harder time tracking that. You can, your eyes can go cross-eyed and bring this together, but, but you can't shift your eyes up and down. So what you're trying to do whether your binoculars are hinges wide open or completely closed or somewhere in between, you want that light cone projection to be concentric about your eyepiece and you don't, you want this light cone to be circular and not cut in any way. And these binoculars are reasonably collimated and you notice they're not perfect. You can never make them perfect, but the question is, are they good enough? Now, this gentleman, uh, Rafael uh, Shemokobos, also came up with another uh, checking mechanism whereby you do this indoors. You don't have to do it outdoors. And you, you, have a, you place a mirror about half the, your focus distance away from your binoculars. And most binoculars can focus at around uh, 10 meters, 30 feet. So you only need to uh, you know, put the mirror about 15 feet away. And you have a light source 
and you project it onto the mirror, and then you project it through your binoculars, and then you project it onto a screen. And you may ask, well, what does that give me? Well, it gives you something like this. Once you have this, now you can start to make some measurements. And I like measurements. So it's not subjective, it starts to be quantitative. So you, you make measurements when the screen, when the hinge is closed, when it's open, and you, you can actually make some measurements and ideally it should be horizontal, right? So now once you have a measurement, you can now start to calculate your error. And from a talk a long time ago, if you remember, if you have two pieces of information about a triangle, you can always calculate the third. So if you have the, this distance and you know what this distance is, you can calculate the error. And the error is very important because there are, what I found out, binocular alignment standards. And I'd be very interested to know which manufacturers are using what alignment standard. Um, but you can see with this that the vertical displacements have to be smaller than the horizontal displacements. These are the diverging and conver converging things. So you now have a target of how good your binocular alignment should be, depending on which standard you want to pick. And this gentleman, Raphael, uh, also has another setup, uh, which he did. Uh, but this time it's more in the form of what they call autocollimation, which is where in, in the optical world, if you, if you take your device under test and you put it by a mirror, you're now starting to autocollimate. And this sort of um, uh, helps, uh, uh, well, it, it really gives you parallel light going at a shorter distance. So anyway, he designed this little rig whereby you have a light source shining through the binoculars, bouncing through the, through the mirror, bouncing back and, and, and projecting onto a screen. And this is what, this, what the setup looks like. So once you have this now, you can start to do a lot of, for me, very interesting things. And the fact that, that uh, I like to make things, I decided to make this gadget that he, that he designed. So I took an old, um, uh, uh, this, is, this was my old air compressor that I hadn't used in years, and I reused the frame for this. So this is a mirror from a bathroom, uh, bathroom mirror, which I recut some scrap wood, uh, a piece of Perspex glass, uh, Perspex acrylic, and a, and a piece of glass. And you'll see a little bit closer what, what, what you use it for. So this is all, uh, this is the rig. And when you take a dollar store light, which is this, shine it down through the binoculars, through the mirror, and bounce it back, you get a reflection of the light that you're using. And that gives you a, a measure of what, how you're doing. And he, here's what I did with all my binoculars. So I happen to have a pair of eight by 42s, which are very well col supposedly collimated. And you can see here's the pattern that you get. And they're not perfectly collimated, and I'll show you why in a second, but they're reasonably well. So. The left side is with the hinge closed. The right side is with the hinge open. And you see with the hinge open, here's where the eyepiece is. And the projection for the light cone is actually in the middle. And here, it should be over here, but it's slightly off. But the important thing is they're horizontal with the hinge open and with the hinge closed. I took another pair of binoculars I own, seven by fifties. And I did the same thing. Visually, they check okay. And interestingly, I had them collimated a couple of years back and I never really used them by the factory. These are Bushnells. And anyone who's got Bushnell binoculars, you can take it back to the factory in Woodbridge and they'll collimate them for you. But now that I check out actually what he did, his collimation wasn't that good. Because here, when the hinge is closed, oh, uh, sorry, closed, you can see this is not bad. This is in the middle of the eyepiece. But the other projection isn't. The eyepiece is over here. So it's, it's off center a little bit. 
So it's not horizontal and it's got the classic vertical uh, drop problem. And here it is with the, uh, with the hinge uh, open and it has the same problem, but they check out reasonably okay. So this collimation is questionable in my mind. Here's my dropped 15 by 70 binoculars and they're all over the map. So uh, here's the projection for the left barrel over here the right barrel should be over here, but yet it's over here. With, the, with it open, the left barrel is mm, getting better. Right barrel still all over the place. So these binoculars have got left and right barrel problems. And remember, the goal is it has to be horizontal, not any kind of a vertical shift. But you can measure them. So now, I have some quantifiable result, what I call quantifiable results. So I can actually now start to measure the errors and I can start to measure how good my binoculars actually are. And depending on what standard you want to apply, perhaps for my eight by 42s, where they're in, in, in this, these kind of positions, it might be good enough. Or for my seven by 50s, which is the dark ones, open and closed, they're at least horizontal, open and closed, they're horizontal, but I have a vertical displacement problem. I, how much of an error that is, I don't know, because I haven't calculated it. But all I'm saying is they're not as good as my eight by 42s. And my 15 by 70s, they're just all over the place, doesn't matter, I have to fix those. So what do you do? So now you know you've got, you've identified a problem what do you do to fix it? Well, there's only three things you can adjust in the binoculars, which I said at the beginning. You can adjust the prisms, and they have to be exactly at 90 degrees, and I'll show you a little bit about that later. You can adjust the objective lenses, because what I found out is they're actually on eccentric mounting rings, so you can shift the optical center, and what you're trying to do is shift the optical center so that the light exiting your eyepiece is concentric and you got a nice round light cone, uh, which is what I'm saying over here. And show your light cones exiting the eyepieces are circular and concentric. And then what you have to do is you got to make sure that the two barrels, binocular barrels, are concentric with the binocular hinge. So that's another constraint. And But being a neophyte at this, where does one do a compromise? Because you'll never get perfect collimation, but you have to make a compromise. So now the question comes in my mind, what's good enough? And then that really depends on what is your alignment standard. You could make it very loose or you could make it very tight. I prefer to probably to make it a little bit on the tighter side. So here's what you have to do. For the prisms, you have to get them to be exactly 90 degrees. And there's tools and tricks to show you how to do that. But if you don't get them at 90 degrees, you can get what they call a rotational error, which your mind, which, which you may not be able to get rid of in your, uh, in your, in your head, because it'll be sort of a, a misalignment. The objective lenses, they're mounted on eccentric rings. And so, which means you can actually shift the optical center of these things all over the place. So there's another adjustment you can do. You can actually go to the prisms and there's some set screws in there. You can adjust those also. And by adjusting them, you can actually shift the optical center also. Because remember, the target is always to get them concentric about the eyepieces. Now, the internet is full of a lot of people doing what I call subjective conditional alignments, which is where they take the binoculars, they look at some distant, uh, distant object, and then they tweak the prism on one side or the other to make the image merge. Well, it might merge on one day, but the next day, if your eyes are a little different, they may not merge, which is why I call this subjective. So, this to me is the wrong way to go, but I know a lot of people do it. So here's what I've done with my 15 by 70s. I've cheated. I set them to my 
interpupil distance, which happens to be 58 millimeters. And then I also did a conditional alignment. And using the jig that I had showed you before, within a matter of five minutes, three minutes, I was able to do a conditional alignment. And now at least my binoculars are usable for me, for me only because of... So what are your benefits for doing a collimation? Well, you get a good stereoscopic image for one thing. And there's a lot of studies that show that binocular vision actually has some um, improvements over a monocular vision like a telescope because you get better brightness perception, you get better contrast sensitivity, you get better visual acuity for seeing res resolving more detail. And that's just because of the stereoscopic image. It also improves on your focusing. Again, if you're struggling trying to focus both barrels of your binoculars, chances are there's something off. It shouldn't be that hard. And of course you get no eye strain if you're doing long time viewing. And the important thing for proper collimation is you can give your binoculars to anyone and they'll be able to use them. So here's what I still have to do with this rig that I had set up. I got to check all the document, all of my binoculars very carefully because I, what I showed you, I did rather quickly just for the presentation. I got to practice the art of, of, of collimation and rebuilding a, a disused binocular so I understand how it all works. And then I have to go to see what my friend uh, uh, Raphael Shimon Kobos has set up because he had set up a very elaborate way of using that jig that I had shown you of how to use an Excel spreadsheet and an iterative process, adjustment process, to collimate your binoculars. And this is ingenious. It's actually very ingenious. So here's a sample of a spreadsheet. So you enter the information, for example, this happens to be for your objective lenses. Uh, there's a high side and a low side, but I won't go into that. But you, you enter the information for your left and right lenses. You enter that information. You enter basic information about your binoculars, all the dimensions and things like that. And then the spreadsheet will give you a target of what you have to aim for. So for example, you make a measurement with the hinge fully closed and you get this kind of information or the fully open and you get this kind of information. The spreadsheet calculates what the target should be for your, uh, for, for, the, your eye, for the projection with these particular dimensions. It, it actually just calculates for you. So now what you do, once you've entered that information, it will now tell you another set of information saying, okay, your next adjustment should be this target. You do that adjustment, enter that information again through the iterative process, and eventually you'll collimate your binoculars depending on whatever standard you, you put into it. Very ingenious, this man, very ingenious. And you can do the same thing with the prisms. So it gives you a target of what you should, your binoculars should be doing and what screws you have to adjust in order to achieve it. it I, I gotta take my hat off to this man. Anyway, this is what I have to yet to try. But I do have a plan B because William Cook actually wrote another book, uh, which I might try. And he, he outlines the Navy's collimator, three axis collimator that he used and the Navy used. And he completely details the procedure, but here's the interesting part. You can use your telescope as a collimator and I'll, I'll show you why. So, this is what a collimator looks like if you want to align your binoculars, at least for the Navy. This is the uh, US Navy Mark V collimator. And all it is, is if you have a target, which is a reticule, at the focal plane of an objective lens, right? What happens is you get parallel rays of light coming out of these objective of this objective lens. If you got parallel rays of light coming out, then these binoculars will think that you look, it's looking at a target that's at infinity. 
And of course, this is exactly the reverse of what a telescope does. So you could put a telescope in place of this collimator and you could do exactly the same thing, provided the aperture of your telescope is wide enough to take your whole binoculars, whether the hinge is closed or it's open. So this kind of, for me, it, at least it intrigues me that I might, I might even try this also. So that's what I have. That's my dilemma. That's what, what I have to do over the next uh, maybe probably a couple of weeks. So thank you very much. I got a question, Fred. Yeah. Um, so you've got this um, jig set up. Can you, in principle, I, you might not do it because you want to follow a certain procedure, but could you, in principle, keep it in the jig and make small adjustments and see where yes. you can do it live? Okay. Yes. However, uh, and in fact, that's what they do with the, with the, uh, the Mark V collimator. That's exactly how they do it. Uh, and they actually have auxiliary tele well, I'm getting a little detail, but they have, they have another telescope that they put behind the eyepiece, which magnifies the error so that ah. you get finer and finer adjustments. Okay, one other, one follow up, and that is you, you've got this spreadsheet that this uh, Spanish guy did. Yep. And he's got how much to adjust the uh, prisms, for instance. Are yep. all prisms, do they all have the same set screws? That, uh, they have, they're, they're essentially the same. They all have two on each side. Huh? Um, they might hide them in slightly different places, but essentially, from what I found out, they're, they're in those locations that I gave, that I showed. Wow, cool, thank you. But you can't diddle too much because you want the prisms to be at roughly 90 degrees. You want them to be at exactly 90 degrees. And if you diddle the prism screws too much without adjusting the front um, objective lens, you're going to cut off your light cone. Your light cone may not be circular because your prism might take a slice off of that, uh, sure. that light cone if you diddle too much. Cool, thank you. Question, any other questions for Fred? Hey, thanks very much, Fred. All righty. Excellent. I had no idea. <laughs> now I can reset my periscope. Neither did I. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I want to finish off this evening with just a little bit of uh, uh, information on uh, some training we're considering. Um, all right, so is my presentation up there? Hello. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so in this uh, COVID uh, environment, um, you know, we would normally be uh, presenting an introduction to an uh, observational astronomy course at Riverwood starting this month. But also there's been a lot of interest in astrophotography. And certainly with uh, some of the presentations we've had with Comet Neowise and, and Krishna's amazing photographs tonight and and uh, uh, the other uh, photographs from uh, from Noel earlier about you know what, what a beginner uh, can do. Uh, I was thinking we should uh, set up some uh, some training. So what we're thinking of doing is running a couple courses in the autumn. Uh, we'll run our uh, standard introduction to observational astronomy, but also uh, an introduction to astrophotography. The uh, observational astronomy course we've been running this for several years at Riverwood. And it's just for the basic, uh, for the beginner, to be able to find their way around the sky, identify brighter stars and constellations, know how to use a star map, understand the motion of the sky, and then talk about observing the moon, the sun, the planets, uh, and then uh, use binoculars, how to use binoculars, how to choose and use a telescope, observing deep sky objects. And there's uh, about, a half, about a half dozen people in the center who have been helping us uh, run this program 
over the years. And so uh, I've been approaching them to see if they'd be interested in giving this uh, presentation online. So this is something that uh, I think <clears throat> would not be all that uh, difficult to put together. Unfortunately, we wouldn't be able to then go outside and observe, uh, but uh, I think it would be uh, helpful enough that uh, you could go out and observe and if, if some groups of people wanted to get together at some point, then we can, we can certainly do that. But uh, um, there's been a, a real desire. We've had a lot of new members and uh, I'd really like to, to run this course. So that's something we're working on. Um, the other thing would be an introduction to astrophotography. Uh, the, uh, I was looking at my presentation that I, I made for uh, uh, you know, an introduction to astrophotography uh, and it's so old that it, it hardly even mentioned digital. It was still talking about film. Uh, but now with digital cameras and uh, you know, as Krishna said, the ability of these amazing uh, cell phones to do uh, good work, we should probably put together a course on, uh, on, the, on at least the introduction. So because you know, the kind of uh, work that people uh, are showing at these uh, potpourri meetings uh, you know, it, it's, it's a result of a lot of, of work and effort and progression. Uh, but it doesn't take a lot to be, at least start and get out and with a camera and a tripod and, and whatever and, and to, to do some work. So uh, a basic course would talk a little bit about the, you know, the basics of, uh, of just camera, single camera, uh, astrophotography and then some of the uh, the challenges that you have uh, in, uh, in taking good astrophotos. Um, certainly a lot of us would uh, would love to take pictures like uh, like Krishna and uh, Brian Gibson and Kirby and, and you know, the other people who have been showing these great photos uh, over the, uh, the last few meetings uh, and you can do it it's, it's not that difficult so I think as a, as a club uh, I think it would be a great effort, especially with us sort of still, you know, semi-quarantined, unless at least not meeting at UTM, uh, to get online and do that. And it's interesting during the break uh, when people were just sort of asking questions back and forth. So this would be an opportunity to, uh, I'm going to invite people who are experienced uh, to come on and, uh, and give presentations uh, on, uh, on how to do various things. and. Uh, for people who are, are new to the uh, uh, to the hobby, um, but it does it, it, you know it's, it's uh, you can spend a lot of money on, on equipment and it does take a lot of practice, but uh, it doesn't take much to uh, to get some half decent results. Uh, so I just threw a few few images together just to give you an idea of what the course would talk about. Uh, the easiest thing is to stick a camera on a tripod and go outside and take some pictures. And uh, it doesn't take long before you can take pictures like this. Uh, this is from Mississauga of the International Space Station going by the constellation of Orion. I think that might be Jupiter, so you can get an idea of when this was taken, Jupiter was Gemini. Um, or the moon and, and Earth shine near uh, some bright stars. Uh, or this was a uh, occultation of Venus by, uh, by the moon uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this is an interesting photo because this really, this uh, event was uh, all five naked eye planets were visible in the evening after sunset. And I organized this uh, public observing session at UTM. And uh, there was such a great turnout that this really gave me the, uh, uh, all of the evidence I needed that we could start an astronomy club in, in Mississauga. So if anyone ever asks where the Mississauga came from, probably came from May 4th, 2002, when a lot of people showed up uh, at a public uh, observing session to, uh, to look at the, the planets. Uh, so the nice thing about being able to take digital versus film, which a lot of us started with, when you take film, you take your images and you guess and whatever, and then a week later you get the film back and everything's dark and you realize you didn't choose the right exposure. Now today it's a lot easier because you can see uh, instantly the results. Uh, the challenges are, of course, the Earth rotates. So uh, if you want to take a picture longer than 30 seconds, uh, you need to do something about that. Light pollution is a, is a big problem. 
and getting a good focus sometimes is, is a bit of a challenge. Here's a great uh, example of what light pollution does to your photography. This was taken by a fellow who worked on Sky News magazine back in 2003. And uh, this was the, uh, uh, on the right hand side was the day of the big blackout. And on the left hand side was the day, the uh, picture he took the day after the big blackout. So you can see the difference. Uh, and he's, he lived up in, I think, in Maple, outside uh, of the city. Uh, but uh, certainly light pollution is a challenge. and. Uh, a lot of our members have been talking about how to get out of the city to reasonable observing sites uh, to be able to take some uh, photo uh, deep sky photos. I like this. It's a star trail uh, image of uh, for Ryan. This is off the internet. I didn't take this. And uh, this is at uh, the Forks. This is uh, uh, Terry Hardman, who was a member of the club uh, uh, back in the, uh, the early days. But I kind of like it because it has the Big Dipper. It has the International Space Station. And it has Aurora, all in the same picture. So uh, on an airplane. Uh, for longer exposures, you need a star tracker or a, a telescope, which is uh, tracking the sky. And you put your camera piggyback on it. Um, but one amazing thing right now, we talked a little bit about a cell phone, is the cell phone adapters where you can actually take a picture through a telescope. And uh, here's a picture from a few years ago that I took with my cell phone on the moon. And uh, the results are great. Uh, but these trackers that uh, I think Noel was talking about were, um, uh, is, is very straightforward. They uh, uh, fit on a camera tripod and they track the sky. And uh, uh, you can put some half decent telephoto uh, lenses on your camera and get some great results. Getting a little bit more uh, sophisticated with uh, telescopes, uh, cameras looking through telescope, it's a little bit more money. Uh, here's a tracker picture of a, of a comet in the Milky Way. So this could be taken with, the, with that tracker on a tripod very easy. All you need is a half piece of milk um, uh, comet. And I think this was down in the Southern Hemisphere a few years ago when they had a really bright one. Uh, but using the digital, uh, making digital photographs, uh, there is the aspect of using computers to enhance the photo or stack photos or uh, taking different types of photos and merging them all together. And that's what I hope we can talk about uh, during the course. Um, uh, some pictures just through the telescope of lunar eclipses and uh, there's the, uh, the X on the moon that shows up at first quarter. Uh, and you can even uh, lug your telescope all the way to Turkey and uh, stick your digital SLR on it, and take pictures of a total eclipse. So. Uh, you'll want to get ready for the uh, total eclipse in uh, April 2024 uh, to be able to take pictures like this. Deep sky objects are a little bit more of a challenge because they're fainter, they take longer exposures, as uh, Krishna was talking about tonight. Uh, but this is a picture through a, a five inch refractor of the Great Nebula in Orion. I think it was just a 30 second exposure taken from my backyard in Mississauga. So. Uh, it is possible to do some of this work in, in light polluted areas. You just have to try it and see how it works out. But there's so much available, so many resources uh, that it's, uh, it is an, a little overwhelming. So maybe uh, uh, we can set up the, uh, the topics in the course to sort of point people to uh, the right resources uh, so that we can get started on this. So anyway, that's, uh, that's what I'm planning. And uh, hopefully we can do that in the next uh, next few weeks. The last thing I want to talk about tonight uh, is um, uh, the uh, uh, next meetings. But first, are there any questions about the astrophotography or the introduction to uh, observational astronomy talks? What we'll do is we'll uh, advertise them online on the uh, group's IO. So um, any members can, uh, can join and they'll just be webinars just like this. We'll just choose some nights uh, where we can, uh, can run through the programming. Uh, my job will be just to identify uh, vo or volunteer people to, uh, to help out with this. And so uh, we've got a lot of resources, especially astrophotographers and uh, experienced uh, astrophotographers who can help us out. 
Okay, well, uh, as it's getting up to 10 o'clock, so let me just talk about uh, what's coming up. Apart from the two courses, uh, we're going to have a, another new member welcome evening, uh, and uh, the members of the council will uh, uh, be involved with just giving new members uh, an introduction to the club, um, uh, what we do in non-COVID times and what we're doing now in, in COVID times. Uh, but we have had uh, a lot of new members join, uh, so uh, we want to uh, welcome them and uh, tell them all about the various uh, benefits that, uh, that we have uh, with the membership. Because uh, one of these days we're going to be able to meet again at UTM, probably not until uh, uh, the springtime, but uh, we've, uh, we still have, there's still a lot that, uh, that we can do. Uh, so I've lined up some talks over the next two months. Uh, October 16th, our speaker will be Paul Delaney of York University, and uh, he's going to talk about water, water everywhere. Essentially, the amount of water that we've now found, uh, not only in our solar system, but uh, in other solar systems and throughout the universe. And uh, many of you have uh, uh, been at meetings where Paul's given a talk, and he's uh, an excellent speaker. Uh, Gary Crawford is a member of our, our center. Uh, he's a retired uh, university professor at UTM, uh, archaeologist, and he's going to talk about archaeoastronomy. So uh, I was hoping that he would be uh, <coughs> our speaker in the in the springtime at UTM, uh, but that didn't work out. But he's agreed to uh, to give a talk to us on uh, on the 30th of October. Uh, Leo Sa Leslie Sage is uh, the astronomy editor at Nature Magazine. He's also a contributing editor at the REC Journal. And uh, I'm looking forward to this talk. Uh, he must have some great stories as uh, he's been the uh, astronomy editor at Nature Magazine for quite a while. And finally, at the, in November 27th, uh, the Osiris Rex mission is a, a joint Canadian US uh, mission. Uh, to land on, or at least to bump into an asteroid and bring back samples. And Canada has a, uh, a, a laser system on uh, the spacecraft. And so they have some, uh, some scientists who will get some of the samples. And Michael Daly at York University is the project scientist. Uh, for that, he's uh, going to be giving a talk. The, the timing of this will be good because they're doing their bump uh, bump, they're bumping into uh, this uh, asteroid, picking up the material in between now and November 27th. I think it might be October sometime. So he'll be able to give us uh, all the up-to-date uh, details on, on this mission. So that's, uh, that's all we have. Are there any questions, comments before we sign off for the night? Just a thank you to you, Randy. It's Beulah. Hi, Beulah. Just thank a you. big, huge thank you to you. Oh, you're welcome. You've been so enriching today. Yeah, thanks for organizing and thanks to all the speakers. Great job tonight. Yeah, it was great. Thank you all the speakers and uh, thanks for everyone for, uh, <clears throat> for showing up tonight. Uh, uh, we're sort of hovering around 35 people, which is always, uh, always good. So um, everyone hang in there and uh, we we'll look forward to uh, uh, we'll try to get those uh, announcements out about the, uh, the courses uh, as soon as we set them up. <clears throat> and uh, again, the new member night uh, is next month as well. We'll send that announcement out as well. What, what does uh, becoming a new member entail? Uh, joining the club, you go to our website <clears throat> and uh, there's a membership fee. Uh, we have a list of our benefits on the website, uh, but uh, there are publications, there are uh, telescopes that we load out, and uh, uh, when we can all get together again, we have face-to-face -face, uh, observing sessions where right. uh, we would teach you how to use telescopes and uh, various things. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, the weekend looks like it's going to be awesome, so... Uh, Enjoy, get out there and observe. The moon is going to be nicely positioned by Jupiter and Saturn and Mars over the next few days. So uh, yeah, we look forward to that. So with that, we'll sign off.
thank you everybody. Thank you for uh, again to the guys. Well done. Hi, Renee. Hey, Renee. Well done. Good night, everybody. Good job, everybody. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Good night, John Boy. <laughs> Namaste, Renee. <laughs>